and thank you for coming. Apologies for the, the slight delay. Um, we're having a little difficulty getting the remote uh, participant put into the actual remote system, although I can see them here on, on my computer. Uh, so my name is not Carolyn Nguyen. Uh, Carolyn, unfortunately, was unable to be here. My name is Paul Mitchell, and uh, I, I work at Microsoft and, and run the policy part of the uh, technology policy group. Um, we, we've had some other travel delays and, and challenges as well, so our panel is a little smaller than was uh, originally identified, but um, I'm, I'm delighted to have some real experts here on a very exciting topic. So to my left, we have Amparo uh, Balaban, that's all right, pronounce it correct. And then uh, next we have Lynette Taylor, and then uh, finally we have Alan Marcus, and I'm gonna let each of them give their own biographical uh, introduction um, before we get into the, uh, to the actually meat of the subject. We only have two microphones here as well, so I think we're gonna do some microphone dances. Uh, also on the remote on the remote participation, when we uh, get it connected, we also have William Hoffman, who I think at the moment is limited only to typing to me. So uh, we'll see what happens. So, and Mark, go ahead. Uh, do you want me to give just my bio or, or get into this? Yeah. Okay, so my name is Aparva Yudian. I work at the statistics department of the World Bank. And uh, my job is basically about helping developing countries open data initiatives. Uh, because open data is a multi-dimensional subject, then uh, we have a working group that includes several units within the bank, in technology, training, etc. And prior to, the, to that, I, I'm an economist by training, so I work as an economist in several regions of the bank, especially Latin America and Africa. Uh, but I've also had uh, work outside the bank uh, as a government official. I work in the private sector, in academics, and diplomacy. So that's my back. Hi, my name is Lena Taylor. I work at the Oxford Internet Institute, where we have a project funded by the Sloan Foundation to look at the uses of big data in social science. So broadly, how is big data being used to study human behavior? Um, we've been working on this for about a year now. We have nearly a year left to go. We're looking to conduct, it's basically an ethnography of big data. We're conducting about 125 interviews worldwide, and we're gonna write papers out of that about the way different disciplines deal with big data, the way you see big data, and broadly the way it's being used. Um, within that, I have a stream on developing countries and big data in development. And within that, we're doing a project to bring together people at the Bellagio Center next year around big data and social change in the developing world. So if people have good thoughts on that, please come talk to me after. Hi. Hello. Oh, Alan Marcus. I work at the World Economic Forum. I'm responsible for information and communication technologies, kind of through uh, two lenses, I suppose. One is looking at the largest uh, information communication technology companies and uh, governments that are focused on these uh, challenges uh, and getting them engaged in global dialogue. And on the other side, looking at the key issues that are represented by uh, those, uh, those stakeholders and how they affect kind of uh, bigger global concerns. So at the moment, we're particularly working on what we call hyperconnectivity. Uh, we call it that because this is essentially moving away from just the internet as we understand it today toward under, uh, looking at everything from machine to machine uh, to new kind of sensor networks uh, to looking at what's the difference between online and offline and how uh, essentially the world becomes digitized and we see a number of, of particular areas of concern. One, clearly, uh, data and what this uh, topic is about. So really looking at uh, how data will be used in the new digital future uh, and the global governance gaps and policy issues that, uh, that go around that. Thanks. Um, so just how we're going to work the session today, uh, I'll, I'll give just a little scene setting here in a moment, but I hope this to be for this to be a conversation, which means I really welcome your input and involvement uh, and your, your questions to uh, any of the panelists. But uh, just to set the stage for what it is we're talking about, um, we're talking about data, and the world is a wash in it. It's becoming increasingly, increasingly more so. There's a digital deluge that's estimated to grow at about 50% a year conservatively, and the availability of this data holds extraordinary potential for societal benefits and for economic growth. 
but at the same time, it creates growing concerns for individuals' loss of control and privacy, potentially impacting their human rights. And balancing these needs will be, will be essential and require thoughtful policy processes that can approach these issues holistically. So in our panel today, we have a variety of, of, uh, of, of experts from different perspectives in the, in the, in the, uh, in the discussion. Uh, and interestingly, data is one of those things that, uh, as I just mentioned, can be tremendously beneficial and it can, have, uh, can create challenges. It's recognized, though, as one of the fastest growing economic drivers in the world, especially in developing countries. And similar to the democratization effect of the internet, data has the ability to unleash lots of innovation. And I think we can identify many examples where access to data has, has spurred development, spurred uh, solutions for social challenges or for health challenges or for economic challenges. Data analytics are being integrated into governments, global agencies, and other development organizations around the world. And that's tools to enable and improve evidence-based policymaking. Areas of focus include education reform, city planning, financial inclusion, epidemic tracking, disaster preparedness, and economic forecasting. But these areas can introduce new risks for individuals. As their data flows across global networks, people are increasingly concerned about a loss of control and a growing reliance on technologies that impact their lives in ways that they don't understand. So it's a small wonder that regulators are concerned about an imbalance between industry and individuals, and they're moving to protect citizens from risks posed by a data-driven economy. In fact, just yesterday, the European Parliament approved uh, uh, amendments to their data protection directive, which I'm sure some of you will have some some thoughtful comments on. So these discussions about data use are frequently carried out in parallel and separate forums. And this is a problem where the policymakers are not talking to the technologists and, and often vice versa. So today, uh, we wanted to tackle the challenge of big data and a user-centric data ecosystem. How can we enable the economic value from the data while protecting the users? Uh, so I'm going to uh, open this up with a few questions, key questions, just to kick it off, and we'll go um, just straight down the panel. And the first question I'm going to ask the panel to address is some specific examples of how big data and open data deliver social benefits and economic growth. And as part of uh, answering this question, I'd actually like each of them to define both big data and open data from their perspective. So I'll start with Amparo. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. Um, I'm going to talk mostly about open data because in the bank we have some experience with it, uh, and just a little bit about big data at the end. Uh, I think that you want me to talk for about three minutes, so I'll try to stick to that. Uh, so basically, we define open data as to having two basic attributes, uh, machine readability and uh, terms of use that allow people to use it for any purpose, uh, including for commercial purpose. Uh, the bank itself was uh, the first uh, multilateral institution to have an open data portal and an open data policy. Um, and as a result of the success of that open data initiative, now, some of the developing countries that are clients of the World Bank have requested our technical assistance because they want to have their own uh, open data initiatives. In the developing world, this is something that is just starting to emerge. I wouldn't even call it a baby. It's, it's almost like a fetus yet. Uh, there are very, very few countries in the developing world that are tackling open data seriously. But I have to say that we are very proud that we have supported most of them. Not all of them. There are some that are doing it on their own. Uh, we have a series of technical assistance and training tools to help them. I brought a brochure that is a very uh, uh, quick summary of what we do. And so I uh, ask you to take one at the end of the presentation. Um, one of the ways that we try to sell open data to our client countries is precisely by showing them the examples of how they can benefit. Uh, 
I personally think that we are in the wrong uh, business when we try to advocate for open data. I think that rather than advocating for open data, it's better to advocate for the applications that open data allows. Uh, so if you show a Minister of Health the apps that are being used in other more developed countries where open data is more mature for health, the Minister of Health of any country would be interested about that. And then the open data is the consequence of that. So from that point of view, what we're trying to do now is to uh, identify a series of applications that can tra be transferred across borders and used in different places. And we also in, uh, improve the efficiency of the efforts about uh, creating applications with start, uh, instead of uh, devoting resources to recreating them in different places, try to find a very good application but with all its technical specification and data needs so that they can be reused in other countries. So we're trying to move from a data reuse model to an app reuse model. Uh, about big data, we have we don't uh, have a, a big data program yet in the bank. I think that the territory about using big data for development is still very, very new. Uh, Vinet here said that she was going to tell me what's going on in other places, and I'm eager to hear her. Uh, we have just, you know, dipped our toe in the pool a few months ago by doing a, a, a big data. Uh, event the bank, but it's very experimental yet. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention, because it could be considered big data, is that we are also on an experimental basis uh, engaged in a program to collect price data worldwide using mobile phones. So I can tell you more about that, uh, but it's still, it's I think the only thing that the bank is doing really is putting its resources into the big data scene. Thanks. Um, okay, a definition of big data. Um, the one that we're using for our project is that it's data which is of unprecedented size and proportions in relation to a given phenomenon. So it depends who you are, it depends on your standpoint. Um, and open data, I guess it's data where the metadata is freely available so that you can use the data as if you produced it yourself. So you can know as much about the data as possible. Um, then I would add that to a definition rather than replacing it. Um, in terms of the potential benefits, I'm, I've mainly been looking at the benefits of big data in and about developing countries. And I'm talking about low and middle income countries, but mainly low income countries. So I'm sort of thinking at the, the bottom end of the income scale, the bottom end of the educational scale. Um, what big data is being produced, what is being used, and by whom. And I see a way to divide it here along the lines of data about developing countries and data for and within developing countries. So data about developing countries, there's, there's a huge amount of potential development policy research that can be done using mobile data in particular. Mobile traces, mobile activity, financial activity conducted through mobile phones like the MPSA program in Kenya can tell us a lot about economic dynamics in developing countries, about population growth, population dynamics, um, mobility and migration, which is very important. All of these are areas where we don't currently have good statistics, where nobody currently has good statistics, not just us, whoever we are, um, on the poorest countries. So it's important in developing a new statistical perspective on issues like urbanization in, in low and middle income countries in particular. Um, the need for services, where to place different, you know, where to place different infrastructure. Um, so it's it's about developing statistical capacity, and it's about understanding scenarios of development in new ways. Um, there's also okay, three categories. There's also the emergency and humanitarian category. Um, again, particularly mobile data, social media data is very important here. I would give the example of the Haiti earthquake. Um, where it was possible to both do epidemiological work using people's mobile traces and to do initial work on what was needed and where based on people's SMS communications. Um, both of those were in context of Haiti, big data. Um, third, I would say there's a very important dimension of it, which is currently going very much under-researched, around the potential of big data to promote rights, to promote voice and participation and citizenship in developing countries. Um, and again, like producing good statistics on places where very few statistics are available, producing
releasing information on who is doing what and where and why can be very important for rights and participation. And we give the examples of, for instance, the election violence um, apps being used in Kenya, in Uganda, um, and also electoral registration apps um, recently around elections. And social work, Global Pulse is going to be using social media to redefine resilience or to help define resilience in places, actually in Indonesia, among other places. Um, so I would say there's huge potential there if local government can be involved, if national government can be involved, and the flow of data doesn't go simply from the technology user to the international community. There is great potential that big data could inform rights and participation on a local level. And that point, I will pass on. Can you keep going? Um, so it's interesting this kind of definitional challenge of big data and uh, open data. And uh, I think there's so many different variations on the definition, I'm not going to add to the confusion and just call it, it, it all data. A couple of observations, though. One, and, and we certainly just heard from the panelists as well, the notion of mobile data. That, that's how we at the World Economic Forum actually got into this conversation. It started um, talking with telecom mobile operators around the world and recognizing that the, the mobile device, the phone, as, as we call it, although it's funny because you know, more and more people don't actually make phone calls with it, but this device has changed the entire world and, and gave us access to individuals in ways that no one ever interacted possible. Now that there's more mobile phones than human beings on the planet, that uh, more sensor data is being collected in a, in a, in a movement of, of activities away from mobile uh, kinds of activities, that this is changing the way we can look at how, how the world works. And so if we want to call that big, big data, that, that, that's fine. Um, certainly the, no, the notion of publishing data, and I think that that's an important point. Uh, so often there are businesses that collect data, maybe much more so than, than even the government. And, and just the recent, since it just happened recently, was the US government shut down. During that time, of course, no statistics were being collected. There was no one to do it. But there are very uh, large organizations, uh, one that I know I use, uh, Concur for expenses, that tracked you know, exactly how the expense rates changed during the government shutdown. And this is data that it can take the government a year to, to publish, um, but they already have it. So you know, do they have the right to hold on to it? Should they be publishing it? I mean, I think these are, are excellent questions, and, and I'm not sure we actually have a collective answer to. But I think these, these are really important kind of dynamics on, on the notion of publishing data and looking at it. Uh, from, from the social good. Uh, the other uh, observation I, I want to put out there is the notion of how data used to be collected before the advent of machines and memory and all this stuff that's highly powerful or uh, order of magnitude difference uh, in size to call big data. I think this is also a very important point that it's the scientific method always talked about statistical sampling. You know, that theory, you collected enough statistically relevant data either proved or disproved your theory, and I think that's that's just an important part of history. Today, statistical sampling is not something we need to do. Complete data sets in ways that no one ever thought about exist, and they're proving, in fact, that many of our theories no longer hold, and that's a good thing. Um, but it also means that complete data sets matter. And complete data sets, unfortunately, create the challenge of, can I opt out? And so this notion of you know, what's good for the many versus the good of the one and the big data sets uh, matter. And, and so there's, there's loads of, of great examples out there. Um, I, I like to, to what's going on now in, in, the, in the United Arab Emirates. If, if you know, diabetes is run rampant there. I mean, it's the fastest growth in the world in terms of, of diabetic people, and it, it's, it's obviously not good. But through the notion of, of big data, open data, and recognizing uh, trends and patterns, they've been able to absolutely increase the effectiveness of treatment and how people are using it. And unfortunately, it wasn't an opt-in, opt-out thing, but it definitely gave them a data set that allowed uh, individuals to have a much more uh, customized uh, treatment and opportunity for themselves, and it's improved uh, dramatically uh, over the course of the years uh, in terms of, uh, of uh, diabetic control in, in large populations. So all three of you have um, have proposed basically very positive benefits from from this explosion of data. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the flip side, um, and maybe we'll start with Lynette uh, in the middle. 
uh, just sort of what's the what's the flip side? Uh, how do we? Uh, what are what are some of the the risks and blind spots that uh, industry and society may be running into? Okay. Well, I think about this mainly from the perspective of the poorest and most marginalized people. So, I guess function creep is a very big deal, as it is with all sources of all very powerful sources of information about human activities and behavior. Um, there's sort of a continuum going on with the use of big data from the emergency crisis humanitarian through to surveillance. And at some point along that continuum, some sort of auditing, permission, consent has to kick in. And at the moment, we don't have a good ethical or practical framework for where that kicks in, how it kicks in, and who manages it. And I find that very problematic, but I think that we're, we're edging our way towards thinking more clearly about that, and I don't think that anybody's trying to prevent it kicking in necessarily. I think that we just don't have the structures in place in terms of government to do that. The example I would give is, is what I mentioned before, the Haiti earthquake. So at one end of the spectrum, you have Flowminder um, collecting information, people's mobile traces, to figure out, first of all, sort of where people are, and second, how to prevent them catching cholera. This, for me, is not problematic. You know, if I'm trapped under rubble, or if you think I'm going to catch cholera, by all means, use my personal information as much as you want. No need for consent there. But then suppose I'm a Haitian and I move into a refugee camp. And suppose you're still able to, through the, the permission arrangement you had with my mobile provider, you're still getting a lot of my mobile data. You're getting my whereabouts from my SIM card, you're getting my calling data. From that, you can tell my social networks, you can tell who I'm talking to, you can tell who those people are talking to, you can see the patterns in my movement, in my communication, in possibly my economic activity within that camp. And suddenly it turns into a state where if my government had that information and saw me as a political adversary, for instance, or as a dissident, or as somebody causing trouble in other ways, then that could be highly problematic. Alternatively, if somebody saw me as someone who needed to be quarantined and came and took me away, that would be very problematic too. And so very quickly, you go from a situation where data should be free, openly available, and there is no threat to the individual, to a situation where the data is out there, the horse is left the stable, there's no way to get it back, and you don't know who has access to it, and where there are potentially very untrustworthy actors having access to that data. So a lot of the data that I'm interested in is data which is moving around in fragile contexts in state-building developmental contexts, where not all actors are trustworthy, where not all uses are trustworthy, and yet it's important to have the data be available under certain circumstances, so there's a real tension there. And it's not a drawback, it's a profound tension. I will answer your question, but then I also want to refer to two points that were made that by uh, Alan a moment ago. So, the drawbacks. I'm not sure if these are drawbacks, but I can tell you what people in developing country governments tell us why they don't want to do open data. And some of the usual concerns are the ones that you mentioned about privacy, but also some mentioned national security. Many of them mention the quality of the data. Quality is bad and we don't want to use data for we don't open. Some of them mention uh, loss of budget revenue from sale of data. Uh, so there are we have a standard list of excuses and a standard list of how we reply to the excuses. Okay? And you know, privacy is, is, is a theme that permeates to this conference and the global discussions about open data and big data. What is surprising to me is that uh, I work in the statistics department, although I'm not a statistician myself, I'm, I'm surrounded by them, and statisticians know about anonymization techniques for decades. They've been using anonymization techniques forever, that there is a, a real crossing in the dialogue. That the open data and big data movement don't include many statisticians. So I think that it would be good if we could rely more on things that are proven and not perfect, because there are ways to de-anonymize data, and perhaps big data helps in de-anonymizing data. But it's like uh, uh, hackers, right? You, you go to a... Uh, more security in the software, and then somebody cracks it, and then you go to the next iteration, and so forth. Um, I want to take issue with uh, Alan's uh, point that uh, statistical sampling is no longer needed. Uh, I, I, I beg to differ. Um, let me give you a concrete example. Uh, how many of you know how the world calculates poverty rates in countries? 
I'll summarize it for you. The statistical agency in a country goes every X number of years and does a household survey of consumption or of income. These are surveys that are done by an enumerator going physically to the house and has a questionnaire. In many countries, this question is still on paper and some are moving into PDAs. And, 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 and they collect the data, it's a long questionnaire, sometimes it's repeated questionnaire depending on how sophisticated you want to get. And then they bring back the data and they compile it and we all use it in the bank to calculate poverty rates. The problem is that these surveys are very expensive and therefore they are not done very often. Why do you need to do something for this survey? Because you need uh, uh, you need to have a statistical inferences about the population and without a sample that is representative of the entire population, you cannot do it. Now, in developed countries where you have really a permeation of other sources, including cell phone usage, for instance, maybe that's not needed anymore. But that's not the case in developing countries. I mean, it is uh, erroneous to say that even in developing countries, the cell phone ownership. There are more, in some countries, more than uh, cell phone subscriptions than, than population. Yes, but that doesn't mean that everybody has a cell phone. I mean, there are many people that have two or three. And data about coverage of cell phone signals is very difficult to use. That's one issue. The other issue is that most of this data that we're talking about is data that is collected through smartphones. If you talk about the distribution of smartphones in developing countries, it's a very tiny percentage of the population because internet signals are not there yet. So uh, for all of these reasons, I think that we still have several years to go with the statistical something and it's, uh, and it's still going to be needed. And the third very brief point is about uh, the using other sources of data. That I concur with Alan. We have to explore using other sources of data than the usual methods. And that's part of the difficulty in this cross dialogue with the statistical community. Uh, and I think that the, the examples that we are just starting to see, but we I'm sure that we will hear more about what's happened during the US shutdown where the statistics is very interesting. And it's a, perhaps a blessing in disguise because people are looking at other sources of data than the government and that's gonna lead to a very interesting discussion. I can see my point. I, she's from the Department of Statistics. I should have known. That this. Um, but but just to, to the point, obviously, fair point, right? I mean, there's there's a, as a as a technology focused person, I'm always thinking way of where we should be, and you, you are quite right on where we actually are. And, uh, that gap needs to be closed. But um, you, you did point out something that, that I think is important. There's aspirationally. You know, survey data that is complex, it's expensive, and certainly through technology, particularly mobile technology, that those prices, those costs can come down, and we can actually collect and understand things in ways that might become uh, more important in the future. But indeed, that that could be way in the future. Um, I, I want to. I don't certainly don't want to repeat what we said because that's that's uh, silly. But I do want to uh, pick up on one point, and that's this notion of trust. Uh, that's something you know we talk a lot about with with our communities. Uh, trust, it, it's a very a strange word. Um, I was uh, just sort of a, a personal anecdote because I, I think it kind of made, makes the point of trust. I, I was tickling my five year old son, and you know, he loves it, he thinks it's really funny. Um, and every time I go up to him, he, anytime I go up to him, he starts to immediately, you know, become uh, protective. And, and I said, Well, what are you doing? And he said, um, Well, I'm afraid. What are you afraid of? I'm afraid you're going to tickle me. I said, but I'm not going to tickle you. But, but I don't trust you. And and I said, well, what does what does that mean? You don't trust me. He goes, because you say you're not going to, but but then you do. And I think that's really important because trust is paramount to the use of data. We trust people with our data to do what they say they're going to do. And the problem is they don't. They do something different. Um, you know, this latest prism thing. Because you know, we might as well bring it up. Uh, that that uh, Ed, Edward Snowden revealed clearly shows what was happening. Not so much that they were surveilling and maybe they should have been, okay, we can have that discussion as well, but because they said they weren't doing it and it turned out they were. That's a trust problem. 
How do we trust the institutions? How do we hold people accountable? And one of the real challenges that I see out there is even where really good law is put into place, really good policy, where accountability is well defined, enforcement is not there. In fact, enforcement becomes very difficult. And we certainly see this in criminal uh, issues around uh, data theft, around the use of data for criminal activity. Who enforces it? Who's responsible? And even though there's accountability that it is against law in many places, there, there's no enforcement. So we don't have trust in the system, which means a lot of bad things could happen. Not, not just a few, but a lot of bad things. And we're seeing that, I, I think, every day. Certainly uh, surveillance, certainly the notion of developing countries wanting to, to use the data in, in un, um, unproductive ways, I, I think, are great examples. But we see it uh, even in developed countries where you know, insurance companies get access to data maybe they shouldn't, um, or uh, marketing companies, we can call those minor harms perhaps, but nonetheless, when people are starting to knock on your door or sell you something, and you're, you get a bit annoyed with that. Um, there's a lot of those uh, types of harms, and I think it's that the ability to enforce accountability in a systemic way, and that recognition that trust is paramount to the system, and we need better ways of developing a trust framework. That's great. That's a great point. And let's let's pivot in that direction. So you mentioned trust and accountability. And to date, our mechanisms for managing accountability have basically been legal frameworks and, and regulators trying to apply the legal frameworks pretty much as fast as they can in a world in which the data is coming far more quickly than they can adapt and in which the new uses that are imagined and not suddenly put into into place happen faster than they can react and faster than there can be a hearing, a public hearing on it. So how can we can we use what we know now uh, to both uh, inform our policy making and more importantly to, to try to uh, create systems that put systems in place that actually enhance the accountability and, and the, the trust. And anyone who wants to go first. Mm -hmm. All right. it's only fair. So fairness, I think, is another important principle to take um, Well, so I think for, for me, the challenge starts with the way I view uh, regulatory regimes, uh, policy, and legal frameworks is they tend to be very black and white. And that's probably a good thing. I'm not a legal expert, so, so I, I'll start with that. That's probably a good thing, but in the area of data usage, I think there's a lot of gray. And, and gray means you need more adaptability. Making it just sort of black and white, I, I think, becomes uh, problematic. If we say, you know, very primitive example, that uh, data inferred about you can never be used for anything other than uh, what, uh, what you stipulate up front, we might miss loads of great opportunities that, that open data, big data, uh, has shown to be, to create. And so, so how do we become kind of adaptive? How do we look at this not so much as a hard rule, black and white issue, but think more in terms of, of adaptation? Now, one of the things we've noticed is in the financial uh, sort of environment, financial networks, this notion of kind of adapting contract law. So although there's some clear black and white regulatory regimes under which you need to operate on a global basis the movement of, of financial assets, you also can stipulate between parties, including multi-party stipulations, on certain aspects of how that would get used under a jurisdiction that exists someplace in the world. So you, you, you leverage the notion of contract law that gives you a little bit more flexibility on, on kind of how to use this and, and, and a system or, or a scheme on how to enforce that because you stipulate exactly what, what enforcement study will look like. Now, I, I'm not suggesting that this is a scalable solution on a global basis, um, but again, maybe it is. I, not being a legal scholar, I, I couldn't say. But I think that notion of adaptation, I think, is really important as we, as we think through this. I guess I've been thinking a lot about country participation, and where it's important and where it's not. And what I said earlier about how data can sometimes flow from the user directly to the international level without passing through any authorities on the way. Um, 
I think that we need participatory structures for consent and for data sharing that work across national contexts. And I think that's incredibly hard to figure out. I think the country level governments have to have a say in the enforcement of data protection, which is not always happening right now. Um, they're not always even aware that their citizens' data is being used in ways which can really impact their national well-being. Um, I think that we also need an independent authority to govern data sharing. I mean, I, I would offer the example of a search warrant. I was just saying to Alan earlier, if someone wants to search my house, they have to go to a judge and they have to say, I have reason to believe that when it's done something wrong. And then they get the right to come into my house and have a look around. This is not true with my personal data. And I would appreciate it if there was some independent international authority which could look at large data sharing exercises, like the ones starting to go on about developing countries. I, I, my particular example right now is the Orange Data for Development initiative, which happened last year, this year. Um, where data was released about Cote d'Ivoire to many, many teams of international researchers without the consent or knowledge of anyone in Cote d'Ivoire at all, arguably for very good purposes. But then you get problems with using the data on a country level because the country was never involved in the first place in the release or the use or the research involving the data. And so if you have an independent authority, they can connect countries, even the local level, to international data users and sharers. And I think that's a really important part of governance, which is currently completely missing. This is very good. Um, what I it's very difficult because, uh, partly because we are seeing the tip of the iceberg. Um, institutions collect data even in spite of themselves. Uh, and to try to foresee all the possible uses of that data by the collecting institution or other institutions, I think it's, it's impossible because the, it's such a large uh, spectrum. But I do think that one of the guiding principles should be, where does the burden of the proof lie? Uh, do I have to prove that I'm not invading your privacy, or do you have to prove that I am? Uh, and I think that's an easier way to go. Uh, and, and, and we're going to, this we, and by we I mean societies, are going to be learning about things that are uh, that can be legislated because they can be identified. But it's going to, that's going to change as we move because it's impossible to identify all the ways that usage and, and, and collection of data could be deemed to invade privacy. Uh, so I think that, that that's part of, part of the answer. Um, and the other part of the answer, and I'm sorry because this is perhaps my economist bias, is that I, I think markets work and the markets are also going to play a, fact, uh, a, 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 a discriminatory role. Uh, let me give you an example. Um, I get lots of mail offering uh, insurance and offering me credit cards and things. I live in the United States. Uh, and, and I'm probably being targeted because, you know, this credit card company states that I have good credit record or whatever. And, but I simply throw the envelopes in the garbage. They don't even open them. I just turn them and throw them in the garbage. At some point, they're going to get tired of sending me these things, right? Uh, and, and if they don't, and they keep want to spend some of their money on a wasted potential client, fine. You know? But there is going to be this learning process also, and markets are going to have to play a role. Thank you. I'm going to ask one more question, and then uh, I'm going to open it up to the, to the room here. Uh, Lynette, you, in your uh, uh, points here just a moment ago, you sort of talked about um, data and the, the sort of issues around it from a national perspective, right? And, and on the internet here, we are dealing with something that is globally interconnected and where data is more or less freely flowing from country to country, not really caring too much about the borders. and we have in that global universe a number of governments at all levels and societies with with uh, a wide range of views on what privacy is or should be and i just wonder how how you think about um, this this challenge of 
you know, globally free-flowing data on global a global ecosystem, and at the same time, what it sounded like uh, local management of the data itself. That's a really good question. Um, I would contend that we already have massive local management of the data itself. That the internet is still rooted in countries. The firms are still rooted in countries, and we haven't got away from that. If we do, then totally new structures will be needed. And the internet does, you're right, have a lot of international frameworks and structures around its governance. But I would say the most powerful ones are still ones which provide country level accountability because you can get sued in, in a country and by a country, not by an international organization. Um, on that basis, I mean, I think that I, I am, however, advocating an international authority for data sharing. I, and I think that's important. I think that it should both be part of encouraging countries to enforce, to pass and enforce and understand laws better. But I think there is really a need for international governance on this, precisely because companies are acting in places where they are, where laws of the laws of their home countries are not enforceable. When you look at major data releases in developing countries, they're usually conducted by companies situated in industrialized countries who have no explicit legal responsibility towards the citizens of the countries where they're operating, just like the US has no explicit legal responsibility not to invade the privacy of the EU citizens, and we've seen some problems with that recently. And something similar is going on between large corporations based in the EU, US, industrialized countries in general, and developing countries. Um, okay, I want to um, contest the basic premise of the entire session about there being a data deluge. Um, in the developed world, they may be, but in developing countries which are, are concerned, we have to see also uh, the, 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 the flip side of that. There isn't enough data, basic data. I mean, we have trouble, we, and by we, I mean not just the World Bank, but the UN system and all the international development agencies to collect the data for the NDG Millennium Development Goals. Uh, we, have, we have lots of trouble to have poverty data. Haiti, it's supposed to be a poor country. You know what's the last time that Haiti did a household survey to calculate poverty? 12 years ago. 12 years ago. So, how do we know what's poverty in Haiti? How do we know all this, all, 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 all this uh, uh, indicated? So what I'm saying is nothing new. Uh, if some of you have read the uh, report of the high-level panel that was put together by uh, the Secretary General of the UN, there was a report that was chaired by Holly Karas, they are talking about a data revolution. And by that, they mean the need to collect more data in developing countries. And we, now I'm saying that the bank in, in particular, are of the view that if it's gonna be a revolution, it means doing something different. A revolution is not an evolution. It has to be using new techniques, new sources of data, and that's what I agree with the, the title of this session about the multi-stakeholder. We need to go just beyond governments collecting data into data that is collected by academics, in, in private sector, civil society actors, using more technology, using new ways to infer data, etc. Et to get the developing countries at least, at least two stages above where they are right now. Uh, but they are, believe me, very, very far from a data range. Thank you. Is there anyone in the audience here who would like to ask a question? Don't be shy. All right, if no audience takers, then, then I have another one that's sort of following along there. Oh, uh, no, no remote, I can just see a remote on my screen. Um, so following, following on this uh, sort of dichotomy between too much data or the deluge of data and not enough data, one of the things, the thoughts that uh, your comments spark is that there's a, a a ta perhaps a taxonomy of data types that we haven't addressed. Um, you address data uh, on poverty, for example, uh, on data that would help us achieve millennium goals or figure out what kind of programs to achieve millennium goals. And then on the other hand, we have data about your uh, shopping habits and your credit history and uh, and 
you know, perhaps your preferences at the, at the grocery store. Uh, and, and I think perhaps that those are two very different categories of data problem uh, or opportunity. And I wonder if anyone would like to sort of, uh, take a, a stab at the idea of a data taxonomy applied to data management. Uh, so first, I think in any in, in any kind of research, in any kind of trying to understand something, uh, I think there are still data gaps. I, I think there are many things where we may have more than enough data, but uh, of course there are many things where there are data gaps. So I think we do just need to recognize it. I think the same point that Amparo made before that you know there, there's the the aspiration of forward thinking that says in the future maybe. You know, we can't have complete data sets, but there's reality of, of where we are today, and I, I think that's important. Now, with, with that said, I think we should also recognize that there's huge amounts of data that many organizations are sitting on that's not available to a lot of people, not available to maybe any people in some cases. Part of that is just out of fear due to exactly the challenges I think we've been discussing. Who's accountable? You know, how do I know I'm not harming someone? Do I have rights to use the data in the way there is? And so these might actually be good actors sitting on huge amounts of data in fear that by using it in some way, they're going to violate something. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the telecom community, which I'm very familiar with. They're sitting on huge amounts of data that they just don't share at all. And not because they're trying to be stingy, because they really are afraid of what it might do. Reputational harm, legal issues, uh, international concerns. And so I think part of solving these problems actually is to get access to data that could be used uh, for a positive sense. So I think that's, I think that's just something to kind of, uh, to kind of think about. I think the, the uh, oops, sorry, what was the rest of the question? <laughs> oh, taxonomy. I, I, so, so one of the things that I think that's, that, that could be useful here, that there could be a technology solution to some of this. Um, you know, Lynette talked about kind of metadata and actually understanding not just the data but everything about it. If we could create a, a, a framework, a, a technical solution around metadata use, that is where the data itself also includes its taxonomy, also includes ownership rights, which might be both tenant, also includes usage rights, and that the system, the technical system that we might call the internet or something even greater, actually knows how to enforce that through the appropriate regulatory regimes, then, then we might solve some of this stuff. And so, you know, do we need a taxonomy to get there? Not necessarily, but taxonomy is going to be important. Um, I, I, to me, it goes back to the big data versus open data versus regular data, whatever that means. There's so many opinions that, that I, I don't know that it's how productive or fruitful it would be to have a taxonomy too soon, unless we have a framework that can leverage that taxonomy. Thanks. Um, I'd like to pick up on something that Amara said, is that academics may have a role in producing and analyzing these new sources of data, particularly about the developing world. For me, an important taxonomic distinction is between data that is understood and where the meaning is considered relatively stable, and as in sort of Internet of Things type data, for instance, and data which relates to human behavior, where meaning can be unstable, where we may not fully understand what it means and where we need a social contextualization process in order to understand, share, and use that data. And I don't think that that, that divide is being observed well enough by anyone thinking about data infrastructures, data sharing capacity, data sharing frameworks. Right now, I don't think we have a stable definition of what constitutes personal data. I like the World Economic Forum's definition that it's as broad as possible. Um, I think that's, that's the best way to go because it makes them think the hardest about how to deal with it. Um, but I think, the instability of meaning is really important, particularly when we come to complementing or possibly replacing things like household surveys. I think statistical stability, you know, statistical representativeness is hugely important, but we do not understand these new sources of data. Yet. It's not that they're not useful. We don't have enough information about them. So in this case, I would say almost metaphorically, the metadata doesn't exist yet. We have to build the metadata around them, and it's it's partly social. It's partly invisible unless you have country understanding, country knowledge. And that's why I say it's important that data shouldn't skip the country level. It shouldn't go directly from, I mean, price data is different, but it shouldn't go to, you know, my mobile data shouldn't go directly from me to, um. <laughs> Sorry. 
you know, trustworthy, though I don't think he's going to tickle me right now, but still, I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be very simple-minded if I haven't been already. Uh, I think that there is a very basic uh, data taxonomy in, in my mind. One is uh, data that it is supposed to be statistically representative of the entire population, and that's basically surveys and censuses. Uh, survey, all types of surveys, not just household, but also enterprise surveys, etc., etc. And then we have administrative records. And part of the problem, in my view, is that administrative records that exist in every developing country are not being used. Um, they, countries, even the poor, in the poorest village, they report the students' uh, exam results, uh, the teacher's assistance. Uh, they have records on, 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 on the health issues. On the, so administrative records is a humongous potential of data. The problem is that it's not being used, and basically for three reasons. One is, in many cases, it's not digitalized. You will be surprised how even middle-income countries don't digitalize all their data. So there are new uh, companies and models to digitalize data more efficiently, and I think that that's a good thing. The other thing is the metadata. You don't have the metadata on administrative records, and creating it is relatively easy. And I hate to blow my own horn, but I think that I have contributed to that because a few uh, years ago, uh, we were asked by the state of Yucatan in Mexico to help them with their statistical collection. And we realized Mexico's statistical institute at the national level is very, very strong. It's a, it's a huge institution. It has more employees than the World Bank. It's very, very large, very powerful. But at the state level, uh, they are seeking on loads of administrative records that they are not using. So we search about ways to compile metadata on administrative records around the world. We search in the United States, we search in Europe. There was nowhere to be found. So we had to create, and we created something maybe very precarious, very uh, um, unsophisticated, but it's something, and it's something to build on. I, I am completely convinced of the power in administrative records in doing things, even in aspirationally thinking, uh, having to do away with the other type of data. For instance, in, in Finland, it's the only country today that doesn't do a census in the way that the United States or all other countries do it. It's the only country in the world that does its national census completely based on administrative records. And I think that that's the way to go. Completely? Take it up to <laughs> Interesting that both of those are in, in Europe. Um, so, and, and so switch, switching to Europe for just a moment, uh, it has been said that Europe is the leading edge of privacy regulation and, uh, and, and privacy rights management. And just yesterday, the European Parliament adopted some, some substantial changes to the uh, privacy directive from many years ago, and I wonder if any of you would like to comment both on the European approach and, and specifically what's what's been going on there over the last uh, year or so, and its, its uh, applicability to the rest of the world. Uh, so for those who don't know, the Europeans have had a data protection directive that goes back many, many, many years, and uh, and for the last the last few years, there's been a, a process underway to revise the data protection directive to try to bring it up to to uh, 2013 uh, to try to account for in in many ways the issues that we've been talking about. Uh, it is it is still a legal framework. And it has it had lots of controversy along the way with over 4,000 uh, proposed changes, amendments, um, you know, quirks and uh, and edits uh, in the in the um, in the run up. They have managed to have public uh, comment periods. They have published uh, various versions of the documents. They've had rapporteurs. Uh, go through the documents and issue rec reports and recommendations. And in the European context, this uh, <coughs> has to happen between the Council and the Parliament and the Commission. 
Uh, so it's a complicated structure, um, and it would appear that it's it's moving towards some some conclusion, uh, at least for this round. But if uh, if nobody's got specific, we can move on. That. I actually was involved in a discussion about this a couple of weeks ago, but I, I thought you meant that they'd actually find me across something. Um, okay, I, I was interested in the fact that the EU is trying to define harms to privacy proactively, and the debate that this is causing on, I'm just talking about this debate, between them and the US, where US companies are saying that they're uncomfortable with this because of US, you sue when your constitutional freedoms are impinged upon. And the EU is going for the opposite model where they say we're going to define what a significant harm to your privacy is, and companies have to justify they're not doing this when they collect and use your data. And I think that from my perspective for a developing country model, the more paternalistic EU approach is probably the better one, because it forces people to think out in advance what they object to and what they don't. And it causes, there has to be a framework within which companies are operating, Whereas in the US, it seems to be completely retrospective and reactive. And that for me is problematic. Um, what's interesting, I think, actually, let me take a step back. So, so first, uh, I agree with Lynette just on certain differences between the US and Europe. I would also say that most of the world, if not all the world, certainly most of the world is watching quite intently this U.S.-European debate because um, I think even to Lynette's point, a lot of the developing countries really don't know what to do. And they're looking to the big internet giants known as Europe and the U.S. just to get a sense of what that means and maybe adapt from there, which is not necessarily a bad strategy. So this debate matters not just to, to Europe and the U.S. I also agree that there's, there's still a lot of differences, although I think a lot of that is closing despite the fact that U.S. companies uh, may not like it exactly. I think that even the American administration, certainly the last uh, FTC chair, was recognizing that there, there might be some benefits in a longer term play uh, by being more aligned rather than, than not aligned. Uh, but it is interesting because when, when the, the commissioner put forward the changes, the proposed changes, the first uh, it's not called the first draft, let's call it the first finalized draft submitted to Parliament, was uh, at the end of 2010, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and what was interesting is they spent two years really bringing in stakeholders, business leaders, American business, European business, uh, international discussions. They brought in all the stakeholders. They did it all the right way. Um, but imagine what happened during the 10 years in terms of data and what we know. The world changed dramatically. And from 2010 to now, while it's still being debated in Parliament, it changes daily. So it just kind of shows that the way regulatory uh, regimes work, it, it, it's hard to keep pace with the change. And I think that itself is, is something to be feared. To think, like, I'm going to draw the line and say, today, this is it. And then tomorrow, to Amparo's point, we learned about a whole new set of things that we didn't know that we needed to allow for. And, and now we've created a law for the next 15 or 20 years that it is impossible to change and disrupts innovation and opportunity. And I think that's one of the things that Europe is struggling with as, as even Europeans stand up and say, okay, but it doesn't have to be so black and white for things that are different. But there are some really important points they're making. One, you should have a say. I, I think this is a really good thing. People should have a say. They should have the tools necessary to make informed decisions. They may not like the choice of decision, and we could argue about should there be more choices, but I think the directive definitely points to the notion that there should be tools and people should be informed and they should be able to make choices based on that. I think it's also definitely focused more on usage and not just collection. I know there's a big fear in Europe on collection, and of course, PRISM is not helping anything in the recent uh, term, but the challenge that the real issue with collection is, is the trust and security. But if we have trust and security, collection isn't the problem. So usage should be it. And I think the Europeans, again, when that points out, you know, they're really looking at what are the harms. So usage is the right model. So there is a lot about the European uh, directive that, that has positive output that we can all uh, learn from. But this, this opportunity for innovation, this knowledge of looking beyond what we know today to the Number of the, the unknowns, the unforeseeable, you know, things that we don't know yet. If we stifle that in, in, uh, because of fear, we, we really are removing innovation. 
Um, a study, we, we worked with the ECG on a study recently, uh, and, and I'm just gonna read the numbers. By 2020, um, the value created through digital identity in Europe is estimated to be one trillion euro. Now, depending on where this directive goes, will have a dramatic effect on that economic uh, opportunity, and we know Europe is struggling to bring back innovation. So I think there's gonna be a lot more debate around this, uh, this issue. I think that there are two issues. One, one is that instead of trying to understand all the ways that this unlawful or criminal activity is happening or could happen, uh, why don't we concentrate the efforts in defining the crime, in defining what's privacy and what is, you know, it's like if you were trying to legislate against theft by trying to foresee all the possible ways that people may steal things. Uh, instead of defining that. So why don't we try to concentrate on defining privacy and defining uh, breaches to privacy? I think that that's a much better way to go about it. And then the second thing is about where the burden of the proof lies. It's not about companies proving that you are, not. it's about, you know, you're innocent and you're proven guilty. The burden of the proof is that who, who feel that they have breached their privacy. Thank you. Any questions, comments from? Yes. Thank you. Um, in your in the heading of this workshop, you, you talk about you use the term data commons, but uh, none of you have really addressed that explicitly. And I think um, if we talk about creative commons, information commons, maybe this idea of data commons is a good way to uh, to have a better discourse on what is actually public information that's owned by everyone, open to anyone, uh, and what is not, instead of discussing open data and big data. And um, regarding this international authority, I was just wondering, I mean, there are so many countries in the world who just don't bother about international standards and regulations, and they would always say, why do you interfere in our um, secret data in this country? And I'm working a lot in Southeast Asia, and uh, in Southeast Asia, for instance, we have this uh, recent very interesting case between Indonesia, Malaysia, and Singapore about the Hague's. I don't know how many of you know about this case, but it, um, it's a typical multilateral problem which would not exist if there was open data policies. Because some some companies in the media were burning down the, the forest, causing Singapore and Malaysia to be in the dark for weeks, causing enormous health problems, and it was actually if we had the data was there, but it was not disclosed. So how would this international agency say to the Singapore government, please give us the company data to see who's actually investing in Indonesia, or to Indonesian government, please give us the data on the land registry? which is open data in many other countries, or to the Malaysian companies as well. So actually, in theory, there are so many problems where we could show if information would be open, there would be a lot less problems and costs, in some cases, particularly in environmental data, and corporate fraud. I just was wondering what are your thoughts on the possibility of uh, fragmentation of the internet following the same revelations? Um, if you think that, uh, to what extent do you think the multi-stakeholder um, approach to internet governance is at stake, and how you think that will affect the use of data by businesses as well as the development of big data? Yes, I was interested to know what exactly the World Bank did with respect to the administrative data in downtown Mexico. I don't think the sentence was finished. All right, so data commons, international regula regulation, um, prism, etc. Who wants to go first? Yes. Uh, uh, let me let me take it in a reverse order on the on the website. Uh, 
on the administrative data tool. What we did is we create a, a way to collect the metadata about administrative records. This is the data about the frequency, who collects it, uh, how, how, uh, with what delay is it published, or if it's published at all, and, and, and so on. And uh, so that is, to our knowledge, the only metadata of administrative records that, that we can find. Except uh, there is a Eurostat methodology that, that exists as well, but it's extremely sophisticated and impractical for very poor countries to try to use that one. Uh, so I can share more details with you, but not really after that if you're interested. I'm not sure I understand anything about the fragmentation of the internet, so I'll leave that to my colleague. But I do uh, want to agree with it. We didn't talk about the data commons. I have to humbly acknowledge I'm not sure what it's meant, but data commons. If, if it's meant applying uh, creating common licenses to data, then uh, that is, in the definition that I said at the beginning of the session, uh, uh, a given, right? Um, I think that more importantly on substance, um, data that is produced by the public sector, used, um, using public resources of the taxpayer to, pr to be produced, is with some exceptions, should be public. And I also want to say that it is such an easy and cheap step for going from public to open, which is a very misunderstood con concept in developing countries, and does not involve any additional risk to privacy or national security. So there is a lot of data that is already public. Making it open is really low hanging fruit. So we're trying to go with that. Now, data that is not produced by the public sector, uh, there is a lot of room for debate about the ownership of that data. Uh, private sector collects data about me. What, do they own it or I own it? The government collects data about me. Do they own it or I own it? It's a, I, I don't have a, a clear view on that, so I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to be quick. Neither of these are my focus of expertise, but my response to the first two questions is what we've all been talking about already, that we need to have a better taxonomy of data in order to have a data commons. We need to have a better understanding of privacy, but privacy is contextual, unfortunately. And so you can't apply a single rule and you can't apply a single definition of privacy. And I think we need to allow data sharing to be complicated, because it is. I think there's way too many searches for a single terminology a single way of treating data. And data is not unitary. And I think it's very dangerous to treat it as if it is. And so I think there needs to be a dialogue about it. And I think we need a framework which can react contextually with contextual knowledge to the challenges of sharing different types of data and different data sets. And within that, you can have a creative commons principle, a data commons principle. But I think you need contextuality and you need to recognize it's complicated. For someone that's not her field, that was very good. It was perfect, actually. Um, context matters. Let's just start with that. Context matters. It matters all the time. Uh, I think the notion of or, you know, uh, even the, the point that Amparo made, you know, who owns the data? Is it the government for me? Is it the business for me? We've got to get rid of these exclusivities, or it's not or. Most data is not created by an individual, it's created by a collection. And so if we start to think about that, that that's important. The, the notion of data commons, certainly the way we look at it, which is very much like the creative commons thinking, it just says, well, let's just agree that there is data that if everyone uses it in a certain way, feel free. If you want to use it in a different way, pay a fee. And start to look at, again, not an exclusive, it's completely open and free for all, but look at it as for certain aspects, it's open and free, and for other aspects, it's about a commercialized opportunity. And, and that's okay, it can be and. I agree absolutely with Lynette, to do that, to solve that right taxonomy matters, and we don't, we don't have an answer to that question. Um, so I think that's, that's definitely uh, an area that I think requires a lot more effort. Fragmentation, or, or as I like to call it, the vulcanization of the internet, I think others uh, like that term as well. Uh, the one thing I will say is, is simply this, data is worthless unless it's traded. 
it, it's just that simple, right? If you put a bunch of data, you, you write stuff, you, you create stuff, you put a whole bunch of brain power into a whole bunch of work, and you stick it on your hard drive and it sits in your home or your business, it's absolutely worthless. It has no value whatsoever, except perhaps uh, to yourself. It only becomes valuable when it gets used, when it gets traded, when it gets combined. Use happens. If we vulcanize the internet, we're removing the most valuable part of the internet, and that's that tradability. I think that's that's definitely an important part. Uh, and you know, you, you talk about the Singapore hate. I, I, I love this example too. Of having lived in Singapore uh, for many years, although a long time ago, we had the problem even even then. And, and yeah, there could be some data opportunities, but I, I look at it more this way, and I say it doesn't matter how much Singapore puts good environmental air pollution control in if Indonesia is going to light fires. There, it, it just doesn't matter. It doesn't stop at the border. I think the internet is the same. It doesn't stop at the border. It doesn't matter what controls you want to put on in your own nation. I think there's a challenge, unless you completely cut off, in which case then you have the opposite challenge of, of non-trading the data, and, and that's a problem. Now, now, Europe has an interesting proposal with the, uh, the Schengen kind of trade of data. I think there's something interesting about that. Um, at an ASEAN ministerial meeting uh, a year and a half ago, I guess, it was in Singapore, uh, there was this sort of interesting call out to have a Bretton Woods of the internet or of data particularly. You know, can we think about how we did it with currency, create a securitized, tradable asset parameter around data, and maybe that makes or helps in creating some taxonomy. So there, there's a lot of opportunity still uh, left for discussion, but the, the organization, the, the whole value the internet has created on the world is, is due to the trading of information. It was built so that researchers can exchange ideas. It's been uh, a lot, uh, expanded so that business can create value. Uh, the, the trillion dollar, uh, trillion euro uh, figure in terms of digital identity doesn't come from organization of the internet. It comes from an open internet. And so I think we can't lose sight of that. And countries that, that do will find out the hard way that, that they're going to be challenged with keeping up with economic progress. So thank you. Um, so we've covered a lot of ground today from um, what is open data and big data through to uh, critical issues like trust and accountability, touching on the borderlessness of the internet versus the localism of, of uh, culture and societies and the potential uh, for, for um, controlling at the local level. We've talked about citizenship. We've provided examples of economic value, social value, as well as uh, discuss some of the harms, the idea of defining the crime um, you know, proactively, uh, discuss different regulatory environments that the uh, United States contrasted with um, Europe, and we brought in the idea of technology being part of the solution, potentially through the idea of, of having a system that can respect the, the, the policies that a, a user might select. Hopefully that's given you Lots of things to think about as you uh, explore the rest of the week. I thank you very much for coming and being our guinea pig uh, first session of IGF 2013. If you are tweeting, uh, hashtags are IGF2013 and hashtag IG4D uh, for this particular session. Uh, I'm going to give the panelists each one minute to do a, a, a final thought or statement, and then, uh, then it's copy time. Um, my choice of final statement is going to be uh, about open big data, which is something we don't do yet. Um, and my concern is that it's a basically on big data analytics, because I think that rather than defining big data, what is interesting is the new ways of analyzing that data that are, are coming up. Um, I have a concern because most of this is about finding correlations between data which can be very useful for some uh, purposes, but for public policy, we also need to acknowledge the limitations of uh, big data analytics. Uh, let me give you a concrete example. Uh, you find an, an extremely close correlation between uh, the number of times that the word malaria appears in millions of Twitter messages and the actual malaria cases in, in, in a country or a region. Okay, so now you're the Minister of Health. How are you going to do that? I mean, 
how are you going to prevent malaria? You're going to say to people, don't tweet about it so it's going to disappear. It's not likely to do, to do anything, right? Uh, so I, I think it is, that doesn't mean that it's useful. I mean, I think that the, the, the Minister of Health of that country will find it useful in, in, in foreseeing where is the trend in a certain parts or in certain groups of the population, etc. And that's useful knowledge. But I think it's important also to know the limitations, at least as far as we know today, and I, I, I acknowledge that some people may know more than I do, that, uh, that this, this uh, analytical method that is circumscribed correlation can be dangerous. I agree about the correlation correlation problem. Yeah, we'll talk about that separately. We'll have to have a fight somewhere in the corner. Um, I think that there's something really important from a development field perspective here, which is that data science is conducted remotely at global centers of industrialization technology, and development happens locally on the ground in poor places with poor information generally. The two have not necessarily connected. They're not necessarily going to connect. The problems that we're seeing with data and development are the problems we already see with development, economic growth in poor countries. The statistical problems are not necessarily going to change, as Antonio has pointed out, just because we have digital data. We're just digitizing the same problems. So how do we avoid the mistakes of ICT for instance, where we have people in developed countries, in international organizations, injecting technology into developing country situations and saying, now everything will be better. How do we get past technological determinants? and make big data a tool for enriching citizenship, for enriching communication between the citizens and the government, and also international citizenship, because it should connect to the commons of the internet. The commons of data and data science should be connected to the, the international commons of discussion and bring the data the line right now. And I don't see that happening. I see us talking about us as data possessors and data analysts, and them subject to the government. And I think it's important to consider that as we have a I guess uh, my final thoughts is uh, data is an asset, right? And it's, uh, it, it can be leveraged to create both socio and, and economic value, and the value is growing at unprecedented levels, both microly and, and macroly. Uh, but we need a more uh, balanced and reliable ecosystem. We need greater transparency, we need greater trust, we need uh, better control than, than we have today. Um, and that needs to be uh, both uh, flexible and, and adaptive. We definitely need to understand that there's there's some differences in the way we're to look at this. Um, and the, the objective should be really focused on the trust flow of data and not just locking down uh, the data itself. Um, so this, in many ways, may require more principle-based governance rather than kind of an absolute, so that locally we can look at the, the norms that are there and, and let them apply, but really to kind of an international or macro league kind of uh, principle-based governance system uh, might be the way to go, which means follows, uh, focusing policies on how uh, data is used uh, rather than the data. Thank you very much. I think we've lost the Thank you very much uh, for, for your attendance. Uh, and I and thank you to uh, Bill Hoffman, who was another panelist who has been able to listen online but has been unable to talk, which is how come we, uh, we actually didn't pass the mic through. But thanks very much, and uh, hope you enjoy the rest of IGF.